Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we finally get to the meat of the matter. Everything else has been introductory up to this point. This is material that you've not encountered before. Well, I guess you probably didn't see the distortion energy theory before either. But this topic is the most important one that you as a mechanical engineer will encounter because it explains why things break when they are loaded cyclically. And in machinery, that's almost the only kind of loading, at least the only kind that, that matters. It's referred to as fatigue failure, and the term has sort of an interesting history. This phenomenon was first observed in the early 1800s on railway axles. The steam age had just begun. It was the first time that man was able to put cyclical type loading on things. Other, to that time, they were building bridges and buildings. Now they're building stuff that moves. It's heavy. It's got a lot of power. And they discovered that these railway axles on the cars would just suddenly crack in two and derail the car. And since the British rail industry was by that time quite substantial, this was a big deal. And so they set people to work trying to figure out what was going on. And a guy named Wohler, W-O-H-L-E-R, this history is in your chapter six in the very beginning, set up an experiment that took him 12 years to complete. And he set up axles in his laboratory, and he uh, loaded them in the same manner as they would be loaded in the cars. Now, what had already been observed before Mr. Waller got into the act, and I'm forgetting the names of the people, but you can see who those are from the little summary in the front of chapter six. They observed that the, the, the broken surfaces looked like brittle failure. And these were ductile steel rods, very ductile, like analog of 1020 steel nowadays. And so they postulated, again, I don't remember the fellow's name that put forward the crystallization theory, but he postulated that somehow or other, the metal was getting tired from all that back and forthing. And the properties of the material were changing from ductile to brittle because the fracture looked like brittle. That turned out to be bunkum but it took quite a long time for them to figure that out uh, when much later they uh, found out what was really going on. We're going to talk about that today. So the term fatigue is a misnomer because it implies that the metal's getting tired. But that isn't, in fact, what's happening. But the, the term is stuck, has stuck, and it's just as good as any other. This shows a fatigue failure. This is a picture from your text. It's a shaft with a keyway in it. And it says it's due to rotating bending. Well, as the shaft turns, you now know that in bending, you've got tensile stress at the top and compressive at the bottom, right? So if you paint a little dot on that thing and start turning it around, that dot goes from tensile to compressive to tensile to compressive to tensile to compressive all day long. So the stress is doing this, up and down, up and down, OK? And it's this back and forth of the stress that causes cracks to grow. Now, the, the, the premise, the understanding now today, with what we have, I have a full understanding of how this thing happens, is that there are three stages. The first is the crack initiation stage, which can be a fairly short time. We also realize that all materials, no matter how much care is taken in making them, will have some sort of little stress rises distributed through them. You know, little piece of dirt or something that got into the steel mix, uh, maybe a, dis a little discontinuity in there of some sort. So there's usually some nuclei where stresses will concentrate. And as you load and unload, the stresses at that discontinuity are very high because of stress concentration. They go beyond the yield point just locally. The whole thing doesn't yield and break, but just a little dot in there starts to yield, and the crack grows. It yields, and then it, the crack closes. If it's going uh, plus and minus stress, the, the, the minus stress, the compressive, closes the crack. So then the yielding goes away. Then you open it up, it yields again. But now it's a little bit longer. So the crack grows slowly. So that's the second stage. So once the crack is initiated, it goes into stage two, called crack growth. And that lasts for the longest piece of the whole pie. And the final stage, stage three, is instantaneous, when the crack grows so large that the 
the rest of the material that remains is not sufficient to withstand the load on the next cycle, and it just lets go like that, and you have a sudden failure, which is, of course, very dangerous. <laughs> so this summarizes what I just said, and let's look at this picture a little more carefully. This arrow says that's the origin. Not, no surprise, it's at the bottom of the key, which is a stress concentration, a fairly sharp corner. And what happens is that as the crack grows, in this case it grew almost all the way across the part, so I suspect the part didn't have very high loading on it. And you see these marks that are sort of cur curved. Those are called beach marks, B-E-A-C-H. The tide does that to the sand when the tide goes out and the waves go out, and you see these little ripples in the sand, right? So that's where it got the name, beach marks. The, this crack apparently grew and grew and grew and grew and grew until all that was left to hold on to this thing was this little piece right here and it couldn't hold it anymore and it ruptured right here. So typically when you look at a surface that has fatigue failed, and I'm going to send some of them around, this is the, uh, probably the nicest example I have, you will see this characteristic. Now, sometimes the beach marks will be all smushed away because it's been rubbing on itself during this process and you don't always see the beach marks. And I don't see very clear beach marks on this. But I see two, dis actually three distinct areas. There's a semicircular area on one side and likewise on the other. And those are where cracks were coming in from both sides. This part was loaded in reverse bending. It's a bracket from a ship. My son gave this to me. He was working for a company at the time that made variable pitch propellers for military warships. And this was a little bracket that simply held a lever on the bulkhead in the ship. And the lever was used, I think he said, for throttle control or something. I've forgotten now what the lever was for. But there was a lever on here. So this was getting, as the lever moved, it was getting bent back and forth like so. And the designer didn't pay attention to the stress concentration problem. There are sharp corners here. Now you can put this back together and match up the semicircles, which are the, where the beach marks would be if they were still there. And in the middle is a little rib, which was all that was left when it finally let go. And that was the piece that suddenly broke. And interestingly, both ends broke at about the same time, apparently. <laughs> they went together. I'm not sure why. But you can see the same phenomenon on the inside as on the outside. There's three pieces. Just send them around. I'll send some more around in a minute, maybe right now. We'll start some from the back of the room. That's nice because I have both pieces. These others, I don't have both pieces. But well, that's all right. We'll send them around anyway. Let's put some on various rows so you all get a crack at seeing something. Two of these look like they were rotating bending. There's some pictures in the book of these sorts of uh, surfaces as well. So these are the three stages that I just mentioned. And a, a fellow named Paul Paris, still alive, still teaching it. 80 plus, somewhere in the US. And in like 1961, he, he was involved in that fracture mechanics investigation that I told you about the other day. And uh, he finally figured out the mathematics of this and about published it in 61. It's called the Paris equation. And this is fracture mechanics like you saw yesterday. That delta K is the stress intensity factor with those funny units of megapascals times meters to the minus 0.5 power, something like that. And beta is a geometry factor which varies depending upon what shape part you have and so forth. A and N are his parameters, the Paris equation parameters, and there's tables in which you can look up the A and the N for different situations. And sigma max and sigma min are the largest and smallest stresses that you're cycling this through. Now, sigma min could be minus or could be plus. But this is a tensile stress failure phenomenon. So if both sigma max and sigma min were negative, that, that is compressive, you'd never fail it because it's always closing the crack. So you have to be opening the cracks. So you've got to go to tensile, then you can go back to zero, or you can go back down to negative, or you can just go between two tensiles. It doesn't matter. If you're going tensile to tensile or tensile to compression, you'll get this phenomenon. So these are the, the regions during which these three stages occur. This is the, uh, the crack initiation, this is crack growth, and this is sudden failure. So his equation describes this curve. And it's this mathematics, there's the table with some factors. It's this mathematics that's used 
to determine if the crack that's in the aircraft wing that's been just found by x-ray by the mechanics is so big as to require that to be taken out of service right away. Or can we put it back up in the air, let the crack grow some more? So this is the equation that you would use to determine that. At this point, I want to show you a little video of a fatigue failure, which I think is quite interesting. It's very short. It runs just a little over a minute. And it's of a test that was done in the laboratory of a running automobile engine, and it's a valve train rocker arm that's going to fail. And you'll see that in a close-up. These are uh, high-speed videos, so they're slowing the action down, so you can see something that took milliseconds to, to occur in a reasonable time that your eyes can absorb. So uh, I'm, I'm going to bring that film in now, and we'll come back to the lecture when that finishes. The following events are short examples of various uses that we have found for the SP2000 high-speed video. In this event, you see an overall shot of a valve spring that is out of control and causing high loading of the cam follower interface and has aerated the lash adjuster. The effects can be severe. This is a single camera close-up shot of a propagating crack in a cam follower. This is a nice photograph out of somebody else's book, a fraction mechanics book by Broek. And it shows micro striations they call them. Now this is a photomicrograph blown way way up. So these are not the beach marks. These are much finer. You can see beach marks with the naked eye. These are too small to see without a microscope. But th this was a test specimen that they deliberately loaded in the fashion you see here. So they gave it a, a big stress cycle then a bunch of little ones then another big one and a bunch of little ones etc etc etc. And following that pattern you can see there's a relatively large striation, which is the, how the crack grew during the big cycle, then a bunch of little ones, then another big one, then a bunch of little ones, another big one, and so forth. So what you're seeing there is the, the, the actual growth of the crack on each cycle. Okay? So obviously, we should minimize the stress concentrations. That's, that's design goal number one is get rid of the stress concentrations. Put in fillets, put in reliefs like I showed you in one of those slides where it's sort of counterintuitive. I take material out so I get a better force flow through there. And we need to talk about the different fatigue regimes. Most everyone's in agreement now that there are two distinct regimes of fatigue, low cycle and high cycle LCF, HCF. And people disagree on where the dividing line is. It's not a sharp dividing line. It's in terms of number of cycles. But most people are talking about 10 to the 2 to 10 to the 4 cycles. So I've, I've decided to call it 10 to the 3. That's in the middle of those two numbers. So 1,000 cycles and below for the total life of the part, you're talking low cycle fatigue. And that's a different animal than high cycle fatigue when you go beyond 1,000 cycles up to maybe billions of cycles, quite frequently billions of cycles. And here's an example. I give you several examples in the book of various situations. And I calculate, do a s bunch of simple assumptions, and calculate in 100,000 miles with a tire of a certain diameter and a car going a certain speed. Then your crankshaft and the engine will rotate about 2 and a half times 10 to the 8th cycles in 100,000 miles. There's a lot, a lot of windage in that because of my assumptions. But you can see it's a really big number. And you expect to get, nowadays, 200,000 cycles up. 
miles rather out of your engine without any major failures and that's accomplished by many manufacturers. So there's different stress analysis approaches to these two situations. I'm going to focus on the high cycle fatigue because in the kind of machinery that uh, is most common that is the, the situation because we very quickly get to a million cycles and a million cycles is considered to be effectively infinite. So if I can reach a million cycles with certain materials, I can say with reasonable confidence that they will last forever. And I'll show you why in another slide in a minute. So for this high cycle fatigue, which is the one we're going to pursue in detail here, we use what's called a stress life approach. In other words, it's based on the stresses in the part and the number of cycles. That's the N. N is number of cycles, S is stress. And we talk, in that case, about a fatigue strength or an endurance limit, those two terms. And they're not the same. The term limit is reserved for the situation in which I can get to an infinite life condition. So if I, if I have a material that is a, able to possess an endurance limit, then there is some level of stress which, if I stay below that, I should never break the part. Okay? Other materials don't exhibit this, this limit. And they, the more cycles I put on, the, f the further down they go, and they finally come to failure. Unfortunately, aluminum is in the latter category, and that's what they make airplanes out of. Steel is in the former category. So steel, I can get infinite life, and a few other materials, but not aluminum. Titanium does have infinite life, and that's used in some aircraft more for its strength than anything else. So the stress life approach, which we'll examine in detail today, is used for this high cycle business. For low cycle, what is happening there is that on any given cycle of the stress going up and down, there's going to be local yielding, perhaps significant local yielding at the stress risers. And that's what makes it a different animal. So if you yield, think of the stress-strain curve, linear up to the elastic limit, a little bit of nonlinearity to the, to the uh, yield point for ductile material. Then it goes flat, either, even goes down a little bit before it goes back up again. So if I'm monitoring stress, I can't tell where I am in the terms of the, of the strain, right? There's a, there's a region over which there's a lot of uncertainty. So we have to use the strain, look at the other axis, not the stress, and thus it's called a strain-based approach. Now, the applications in which this is necessary to be used, one most common, is uh, aircraft turbines. Now, aircraft turbines spin really fast, as you know. 10,000 RPM or thereabouts is not uncommon for the shaft speed. So those parts are subject to high cycle fatigue. But the turbine blades themselves are just sitting there on the wheel, and they are subjected to centrifugal force. So they have more or less a constant tensile stress on them, and they run at pretty much constant speed all the time once they're up in the air, right? except for landing and takeoff. So it's more or less a constant stress in the same direction. It's axial. But there's huge thermal cycles. Engine starts off cold in the morning. They fire it up. And it, you, could, you could cook your lunch in there. It's really hot inside that turbine. So there's huge thermal expansion. And that's what's creating these cycles. Now, those cycles are once or twice a day, right? Depends on whether they shut the, air down com uh, the plane down completely when they are um, changing passages over at the airport, and whether they get a chance to cool down fully or not. So depending on the service activity of the plane, you could have several cycles of thermal a day. And that keeps you, for the life of the engine, between teardowns and rebuilds under the 1,000 cycles. And they're mandated by FAA rules to be torn down, inspected, and, and fixed if necessary every so many hundreds of hours or something like that. So you stay within that 1,000 cycle regime. And the third approach is the one I discussed the other day, fracture mechanics. And that's the most difficult to apply, but it also is the most accurate using the Paris equation. And I can predict with more uh, reasonable certainty when this thing is going to come apart as I watch that crack grow with this technique. This is also used in that aircraft engine type situation. So either of these two is valid for low cycle fatigue. 
the first one is not safe to use, the stress-based for, so, for low cycle. But I'm not doing aircraft engines, so I'm not going to go there. We're doing just regular old machinery, shafts turning, gear teeth, and all that sort of stuff. And those typically have lots and lots of cycles over their lifetime. So that's the one we're going to concentrate on here. Now this shows uh, three general scenarios that have to be handled slightly differently in terms of the equations. So we, di we distinguish between them and give them names. Probably the most common is fully reversed, and that would be the situation when you take a shaft like this and you spin it and you subject it to bending loads, side loads. Put a gear on it, you're going to have side loads, pulley, whatever, right? And it's just spinning. And maybe all this thing is doing is driving a big fan over there. And it's just a pulley and a belt. And it's spinning like crazy. But there's a pull from the belt tension. And so any one spot on that shaft is going tension, compression, tension, compression, equal amounts, up and down, all day long, right? That's the fully reversed case that you see on the left. In the middle is what's referred to as a repeated case. In this case, it goes from zero to peak back to zero again every cycle. And the general case called fluctuating is it goes from something to something. It could be plus and minus, plus and plus, minus and minus we don't care about because it's not going to break. So this is the general case, and those are two special cases of the general case. And we can handle them a little more simply, at least the first one. So some terminology here. Stress range, delta sigma, is just the difference between the largest and smallest stress. The alternating component, sigma A, is simply the difference between those two divided by two. And the mean stress, if any, this has zero, is going to be the, the average value of the peaks, min plus max over two. These are the ones we're going to use to do our calculations is the alternating and the mean components. Now, in the case of the fully reversed, sigma mean is 0. And sigma mean here is equal to sigma alternating, right? And over here, they're different. Now, Mr. Waller, whom I mentioned briefly at the beginning, is the guy that's tested axles for 12 years someplace in England, and uh, discovered that, well, first, he, he took them to failure. Then he tested, he cut a piece out, put it in the testing machine, and proved that it was still ductile. So that was the first nail in the coffin of the crystallization theory that the metal was changing. So they, they hadn't yet figured out exactly what was happening, but they knew that was not the right answer. So what he found was very interesting. This is number of cycles. This is strength. And this value is the ultimate tensile strength. And if you have one cycle, then that's it. It's, you'd have to stress it to that to really break it, right? But as you increase cycles, the, the strength, the apparent strength, reduces. And this is, by the way, a log-log plot. It's not a true linear function, but if you plot it on a log-log paper, it turns out to be a straight line. So we usually do that. So it's coming down in an exponential fashion, actually, with the number of cycles. And if it's steel or a few other materials that have this so-called endurance limit, at around 10 to the 6 cycles, it starts to level off. And we call that the endurance limit. And I've labeled it S sub E for endurance. And there's a prime on it. And the prime indicates that's the so-called uncorrected endurance limit. And the reason for that is we have to apply some correction factors before we can use the number. More about those later. but. This information is going to come out of a test that's done in a laboratory, much like the tensile test, on a, on a specimen of a particular size and shape. It's usually round, looks a bit like the tensile test specimen. It's a little bit different, the different size, standardized size. It's about that long. You can hold it in your hand. It's about 10 millimeters in diameter at the belly, actually more like maybe eight or nine. It's 3 tenths of an inch in diameter at the smallest diameter. And there's some detail on the end so you can grab it. And the most common test is called a rotating bending test. So uh, a fellow named Moore, R.R. R. Moore, came up with a clever design for the fixture that by hanging weights, he can put a, bit, a bending moment on this thing. 
without actually touching the middle of it. You don't want to put a side force on it because that's going to give you funny business. So he, he loads it from the ends with a moment like this, and he spins it. And he runs it at 1725 RPM because that's the, the speed of an AC motor. And it takes, I think, I can't remember the number, four, four hours to get to a million cycles or something like that. I mean, do the math at 1725 a minute. And it takes like 20 days to get to 10 to the 8th or something, something ridiculous like that. So you don't get the test data in a hurry. And what you're going to do is put more, a certain amount of load on the thing, run it until it breaks or not, record the number of cycles at which it broke or didn't, and the load that you had on it, which of course converts to a stress, right? So for a given stress level, if you put a very low stress level on it, you'll find it never breaks. If you keep increasing the stress, at some point it starts to break at, say, 10 to the fifth cycle, put more load on, the next specimen breaks at 10 to the fourth, and so forth and so on. So you have to develop a whole bunch of statistical data to get anything out of this. So it takes a lot of effort. Now the dotted line you see here represents other materials that don't have an endurance limit. They just keep going south and presumably eventually cross the axis. You'll see some actual test data here in a second. So this point, again, is SUT. This value is SE prime, or in the case of the, uh, let's see what's coming up here. This little kink is called the knee of the curve, okay, where it changes from a slope to a flat. That's referred to as the knee. That knee occurs around 10 to the 6 cycles. And these are some of the materials that will exhibit that. Low strength carbon steel, some stainless, iron does, molybdenum does, titanium does, some polymers do, not many, but some, and we have that about at uh, 10 to the sixth. So we usually recite the endurance limit to be at a million cycles. That's the standard. For a curve with a knee, material with a knee. Materials that don't have a knee, aluminum, magnesium, copper, nickel alloys, some other stainless steels, depends on the particular alloy. And high strength carbon and alloy steels don't show the knee. So when I add carbon to get a real high strength tool steel, I'm giving up some ductility and I'm also giving up this infinite life business. Uh, that doesn't mean I can't use it, but I have to be aware of the difference. So in the absence of a knee, it's generally agreed to take the number that it happens to be at 5 times 10 to the 8th cycles. So you pick the number off the curve at 5 times 10 to the 8th, well beyond 10 to the 6th. So most aluminum data you'll see will be at 5 times 10 to the 8th. And it should say so. So in, And now it will not call it a limit. It'll be either endurance or fatigue strength at 5 times 10 to the 8th cycles or whatever they tested it for. So you might find other data in the literature that's at a different number of cycles but they need to tell you the cycles because it is not going to turn the corner. So this is some actual test data. Wrought steel, less than 200,000 200, PSI, I should say, of ultimate tensile strength, which means it's not a super high strength steel, regular steel, not a high carbon steel. And you see there's a lot of scatter in the data. Every circle represents a broken part. So some of them broke after only about 10 to the, um, well, 5 times 10 to the 3 cycles is here. Notice this curve now starts at 10 to the 3 instead of starting at 1 because that's low cycle fatigue. We're only looking at the high cycle fatigue regime here, which is 10 to the 3 and up. But the important thing to take away from this is that you've got a huge amount of scatter. So we have to apply some statistics to this to get a safe value. We want to be down here with our stresses, right? And we would take Perhaps this number is the endurance limit. And these specimens never broke out of 10 to the seventh cycles, which is as far as they took this particular one. Here's some more test data. Now, this is for aluminum. And there's wrought aluminum, which would be that which you get off the mill. You know, that would be round bars, rectangular bars, angle iron, angle iron aluminum, <laughs> angle aluminum, or whatever, right? Any shapes that were rolled out. Uh, permanent mold cast, that's often called die cast. That's where you make a very expensive hardened steel die and you inject molten aluminum into it, hold it shut till it cools, open it up, take your part out. 
and the bottom sand castings, which you're familiar with, I would hope, from ME-1800. You know, you make a sand mold, pour the molten metal in, and then knock the sand off, and you get your part. So very big difference in terms of the way the material is, is uh, processed as to how what kind of strength I get. Uh, these are thousands of pounds per square inch over here, and I'm ranging from 25 to 80 or thereabouts. Um, and there's no distinct knee. I mean, you could still argue that's a knee and a curve, but it's, it's not typically called a knee. But the slope changes somewhere between 10.6 and 10.7 cycles and becomes less steep. That's good news for us because it's not heading for, the, heading for failure quite so rapidly if you get way, way out there in the high cycle regime. So this, again, would be sited probably at, well, this looks like it's 5 times 10 to the 8th where it ends right here. They took it out to 5 times 10 to the 8th and then report these numbers for the fatigue strength of the aluminum. So how do we determine this? Well, you pretty much have to test. And if the situation is life endangering, such as an aircraft, you really have to test a lot. And what you see there is, I can't remember if that's a 757 or 767. It's one of the more recent Boeings. I got this picture from them. And it's in a test rig. This is a finished fuselage and wing assembly. The, the engines are not on yet. And they actually made this test rig, which is probably as much work as making an airplane, to make the test rig. And it's a framework in which they can support the aircraft and then apply loads to the wing tips over here in this structure. And they take with hydraulics and do this to the wing for 10 to the 8th cycles, 5 times 10 to the 8th cycles. It takes a while, right? And they'll put monitoring gauges, strain gauges and whatnot on the inside, on the, on the, the spars, so they can measure what's going on. And they will get measurements of strain which, of course, you can convert to stress, right? So now they have test data, not for some nice, pretty, polished aluminum specimen that's done in the laboratory with a rotating beam, but the real deal, the real wing spot with the, the same size, the same shape, the same stress concentrations, and all that jazz, that's good data. That's how they get away with safety factors of 1.3, because they got really good data on the strengths of their materials. Without that, you've got to back that stress uh, safety factor off to account for the unknowns in your material. That's expensive to do. Automotive companies do the same thing. Test the actual parts to failure for long cycles. Well, we don't often have that test data. If you're not Boeing or GM or Ford, you probably don't have any way to get that test data. A word about how the auto companies do it, as you probably will find interesting. I haven't talked very much about loading cycles, and I don't think I have the slide in here that's in the book. But if I have a machine with a shaft, and the shaft's going around all day, and I know what speed it's going, I know what loads are on it, I can predict the stress is pretty good, right? It's always running at the same speed. But now switch to an automobile, some part in the chassis, say some suspension part or other, what are the loads going to be on that? Well, if I take it down a nice smooth street and I drive slowly and carefully, the loads are going to be fairly low. I give it to my teenage son, all bets are off, right? <laughs> He's going to jump it at the first opportunity and the loads are going to go way through the roof. Been there, done that. Now I've got to worry about teenage grandkids. I don't love me with my car. Anyway, <laughs> so how do you find out what the loads are in something like an automobile or any vehicle? Because if it's a vehicle, and there's an operator involved, you have no idea what's going to happen to this thing, right? You've got a bicycle. So here's what they do. You instrument the Dickens out of the, of the car. You've got a prototype of your car, right? And you have a test track. All automotive manufacturers with this salt have a test track or two, right? And so you put strain gauges all over the suspension system and accelerometers and you name it, and you've got computers riding in the car, logging data like crazy, or you telemeter it back to a, a fixed computer. This is big buck stuff, right? And your, your test driver gets in the car, and the, the uh, test track has potholes and bumps and all that sort of thing. In fact, rumor has it that I think it was GM at one time went down and took a mold of one of the worst streets in Detroit. And they made their test track <laughs> like the lousy street in Detroit so they could run their cars over it. They didn't have to look far to find a bad street in Detroit, by the way, but uh, I've been there. Uh, so 
you get all this test data of what the strains are in the parts, and thus the stresses, when you run around the test track under different conditions. Now, you could go out there every day with every different car and do this, but you know, it snows, it rains, it ices. Can't always do that year round. So, you, nice to do this back in a nice warm building, wouldn't it? So, what they do is they buy what's called a four post shaker, four hydraulic jacks, in essence, that have very rapid response. Yeah, they do exactly that. And you can drive these with a computer with any sign, sort of way you want, and make them do this in phase, out of phase, you name it. So they take the data from their test drive, and they, with some very fancy mathematics, which I'm not going to go into here, since it's way off the beat for this course, they convert that into computer waveforms that will simulate that same load into the chassis. Then you take your test car, and you fasten it down, either on the tires or on the axles, depending whether you want to include the tires in the system or not, and you lock it down to the four-post shaker, and you get out of the booth for safety behind the glass, and you push the button, and you run the car around the track all day long until something gives. So you can very nicely now, with modern technology, generate test data. But if you're working for Joe's engineering shop down the street, who has one lathe on Bridgeport, you can forget about that. So what, what are you going to do to get test data now? You've got to estimate it. So we use theory, test data, experience, and by all means, we lean on the conservative side here. So here, here's how we go about estimating it. This works pretty well, actually. We'll start by creating this S sub E prime for a material. Now, I'm talking about materials with knees here, so this is typically steel. And it says for steel there. We have good data on the SUT. That comes from the tensile test specimen. So that data is all over the place. So I can get those numbers easily. So I'll take, it's been shown by many of these test data that the uh, good starting point is about half the SUT. So we take half of the SUT and call that S sub E prime. That's the uncorrected endurance strength for steel. Now, if the, if the ultimate tensile strength is greater than 200,000 pounds per square inch. That's a high strength steel, and those don't behave as nicely, and therefore we cap it at 200,000. And thus, we never go above 100,000 PSI with the S sub E prime. For, even for a steel that might have 250,000 SUT or 310,000 SUT, we cap it at the, as if it had 200. That gives the starting point. Now, for iron, it's about 4 tenths. This all comes out of test data. For um, materials without a knee, aluminum, for example, 4 tenths looks to be a good number of the SUT. And sim similar phenomenon here. Very high strength aluminums are not as good in fatigue. So we're going to cap this at 48,000 PSI for ultimate tensile. And that works out to be 19 KSI is the 4 tenths number. And so we cap it at 19 KSI, or 130 MPa, for aluminums that are stronger than that number. Uh, and we give, get a starting point. Now, notice this is not an S sub E prime. It's S sub F prime for fatigue at n equals 5 times 10 to the A cycles. I always have to specify for a non-knee material what cycle life you're talking about. For copper, similar story, 4 tenths again coming out of the test data and capped at 14. Now, what do we do with this S sub E prime? Well, we have to recognize, first of all, that the S sub U T number is coming out of a carefully made, polished, nicely finished, small test specimen. That's what they stuck in the test machine, right? And it's got a nice surface finish. It's only 3 tenths or so in diameter or something in that ballpark maybe three-eighths uh, three of an inch. And it's been well shown by experiment again that since we know that discontinuities and other things in the material that don't belong there are going to cause the start of a crack growth, the bigger the piece, the more statistical likelihood there is I have some of that stuff, right? So a small piece is less likely to have crack stuff than a big piece. So we're going to factor this number down as the part, our part gets bigger than the test specimen. 
These are going to multiply by S sub E prime, as you can see, and they're typically less than 1. 1 or less than 1. So 1 would not change the S sub E prime, and something else would lower it. So C sub size, if I had my real part the same or smaller than the specimen, I would make that 1. The load, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, I got some pictures for that. But let's take these slides as they come here. So for materials of an E, we just change this to S, to F at some number of cycles. And I do this put pretty religiously in the book. So if you see an E, that's an endurance limit. That implies a knee, and if you stay below that, you should be OK for any number of cycles. Now, we're going to discuss these factors one at a time here. The load factor is either 1 or 0.7, depending upon whether you're in bending or you're in axial loading. Now, I throw shear in with the bending because I'm going to do it with von Mises. So I'm going to, as a general rule, even if I have a pure torsion case where I have nothing but shear stresses, I could just as well create a shear endurance strength and compare those two. And I get the right answer. But for consistency, what I'm suggesting in the book is that you always calculate the von Mises stresses, whatever your situation. And then we can consistently apply the von Mises, which is analogous to a bending stress, it's tensile, to a strength parameter based on bending, uh, rather based on tensile data. Now, why is the axial different? The axial is only 0.7 because in the last probably 40 plus years, with the advent of servo hydraulic testing machines, Instron was the originator and the often hear them referred to as Instron machines, just one brand. And these are machines with very powerful hydraulics in them that can be programmed to do fully reversed, or I can do any combination of plus and minus I want, right? So I can get tests for fluctuating and repeating and all that jazz. So that's become sort of the method of choice, the old more bending, fitting bending thing. I think it's still used, but you can do a lot more with one of these hundred to to $500,000 machines, right? So now you have lots of data out there to compare to the old rotating bending test. And it turns out that all the axial testing data is lower by about a factor of a quarter. And why? Well, the, the theory is, again, when you take a beam and you rotate it in bending, you have maximum stresses at the surface, right, and zero at the center. So the portion of the cross-section that's actually highly stressed is small compared to when I do this back and forth. I now have F over A, the entire cross-sectional area. I have more likelihood of encountering some kind of a stress riser in the whole cross-section when I put it up to the same stress. And that's the theory as to why we get lower numbers out of the axial test data, which are probably more accurate, by the way, than the bending. But the, uh, the bending got there first, so we kind of use that as the reference. So that's the 1. And then we will dock it down to 0.7 if we have axial loading in our system. OK? Does that make sense? You all with me on that? Size correction. As I said earlier, if I have a bigger part, it's more likely to have flaws uh, in its cross section, no matter how it's loaded. And so the specimen's 0.3. So if it's less than 0.3 or equal to 0.3, we call this C size 1. And if it's Greater than that, we uh, take an empirical formula that, that uh, I think Shigley and Mischke came up with some years back. And with those, with those coefficients and exponents, we sort of track the data. There's a lot of scatter in the data, but you know, there's plenty of data available. And so it's a fitted curve to the data. So I can use that formula. And there's two different ones there for metric and English, because the constants are different. Notice the, the exponents are the same, but the multipliers are different, because you're in different units. And you cap this out at 0.6. So you've got a really, really big part, and this says it's 0.2. So I'll take 0.6. Now, that's OK for a round part, and we have a lot of those. But often, we have something not round. So how do we get from you know, a funny shape like this thing Kind of heavy to pass around, but you may want to look at it up close afterward as an aside. This is a fatigue field part, quite a large one. 
and the crack started at the little tapped hole, and it burnished away a crack the size of my finger, and the rest of it just let go all of a sudden. That is case study chapter six. Very interesting case study based on a consulting job I did eons ago. One of the more interesting ones I came across. I made a case study out of it. Back to this. So I got a funny shaped thing. How do I get an effective diameter? Well, someone came up with the idea that seems to work pretty well. Said, well, you know, if you have a round thing in bending and you're rotating, then the, uh, the outer, the M&M &M shell is getting most of the stress, right? And the, the chocolate in the middle is not feeling too much. Yeah? Can you picture that? So they said, well, it's probably the outer 5% that has, well, I guess they did it a little differently. They said, that portion of the cross-section that has at least 95% of the maximum stress at the surface, which may not be 5% of the radius, 95% or better of the stress, take that area, the area of that M&M &M shell, and convert that to a solid round thing. And that's your effective diameter. OK? That makes sense? So that's what this formula is doing for you. Get an equivalent diameter. You have to figure out what's the A95 area. That's not too hard to do. And divide that by that factor and take the square root. And you have an effective diameter, which you can then plug into this formula up here to get a C size factor. OK? Are you starting to understand why there are no exact answers in engineering? <laughs> we are happy to get an answer to this within a few percent. That's really good. 10% on a bad day, I'll take. Surface effects. Now, this, this specimen that was originally tested in the test machine or whatever was nicely finished. You know, they took some pains to get a nice smooth finish on it. It doesn't have any nicks and gouges and scratches and things like that. It's, it's as perfect as you can make it. So it doesn't have any stress risers on the surface. Might have some in the middle you don't know about, but the surface is nice. So my part's not going to be that good. I'm not going to polish it most of the time. Too expensive. So we've got to now downrate the strength based on the surface factor. So again, empirical data coming out of Juvenal's book here. Excellent book, by the way. It's long out of print. Stress, strain, and strength. Very old book, but a very good one. And so if you have mirror polished, you're, you're the same as the specimen. So it's one. OK, that's fine. But if I have fine ground or commercially polished, it drops down to around 0.9. Now what's going on down here? His tensile strength in thousands of PSI, and up there it's in MPA, I think. No, I'm sorry, that's in Brunel hardness, which are related, by the way. You can get an approximation of SUT for any material if you know it's Brunel hardness. It's 500 times Brunel hardness is approximately SUT in PSI. So if I have no, if I have no data, they bring me, say this is steel, which it isn't, they bring me this part and say, uh, can you figure out why that broke? I say, well, what alloy is it? Well, I don't know. <laughs> what kind of steel? I don't know. What's its strength? I don't know. <laughs> they know nothing. <laughs> so what am I going to do? Well, I can do two things. I can take a little piece of it, send it out, pay some money, have an assay done, find out what the carbon content is and all that stuff. But I don't know what the heat treat is. So I don't know what the strength is. So I take, a, a, take this, a piece of this to the hardness testing machine, which is simple to do. You may have done it in I mean, 1800. I don't know whether they teach you that. But you simply put a dent in it, and you measure how deep the dent is with a certain load. And that tells you the hardness. So I can get the hardness measured and convert that to an ultimate tensile strength. And that's how I get my information on the strength when I have no other data. Okay? Back to this. So as I go into the higher strength materials, there is more of a hit on this surface finish because they are more notch sensitive. The higher strength materials particularly in steels. This is all steel data, by the way, I think. The high strength steels lose their ductility. One of the trade-offs for making them strong by heat treat is you reduce the ductility. Ductility is your friend in this business. Brittleness is not. So they're losing some of their ability to withstand the lousy surface finish based on the ultimate tensile strength. Machine surfaces are really taking a hit. You're all the way down to 0.6 out here. Hot rolled, this is the I-beam right off the mill. Rough surface, scaling, 
way down here. As forged, even worse. Similar rough surface. The dotted lines are corroded in tap water or seawater, and it really goes to the dogs then. So you can see the corrosion is a serious issue with this, and uh, all this other stuff has said nothing yet about corrosion. So I'm going to apply some factor from this chart, and I, I've shown you in the book how to convert this using Shigley and Mischke's routine with some multiplier and an exponent, which you can pull those out of a table that I have in the book for machined, for ground, polished, what, what have you. Here they are right here. So for ground, machined, hot rolled, as forged, these are your A's and B's for that formula. So I've set this up in the book so you can do all of this on the fly in a computation inside the computer program. I don't want to have to stop and go look in the book at a chart and pick a number off a chart and go type it in. So all these A times whatever to the B power are designed so you can build them into a routine. And when you put in the number that you have for size or diameter or whatever, it just calculates the value for you right away. Temperature, of course, would have a negative effect if I got real hot. But notice where the cutoff is. It's 1 up until 450C, or 840F. This is, again, for steel. It would be different for other metals. So steel strength doesn't start to go downhill until it gets quite hot. So in most applications, you're looking probably at a 1 here, unless you're in inside a furnace or something like that. And finally, I think finally, we have to take into account the statistical scatter of the data. So you've seen some of that. There's plenty more in Chapter 6. I urge you to thoroughly read Chapter 6. It's the linchpin on which the rest of the book is built. It's so very important that you understand the material in that chapter. So this is just off of a statistical distribution chart, like a, like a Gaussian curve. You know, It's not a Gaussian in this particular case. It's some other s similar curve. But for 50% probability, the value you apply is 1. Why is that? Well, most of the data you find for these materials is average values. So you could be above or below that. So if you're happy with average values and having a 50% chance of being weaker, then by all means use 1. But if, you, if you're a little conservative, you might want to have a 99% chance of being good and a 1% chance of being bad. That's your factor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down to this. And that's going to reduce your apparent strength. I'm running out of time, I see, so I'm going to try to f f finish this up. So here's our corrected diagram with all those factors applied. This is the evidence for why axial looks different. This also shows the knee at the low cycle mark, 10 to the 3. This is push-pull and, and rotating bending. So rotating bending shows stronger than the push-pull, which is axial. Electroplating is a negative in this case. For reasons that aren't fully understood, I don't think. This, it may have to do with hydrogen embrittlement, because there's hydrogen in the process of plating. And uh, you'd think that plating would be a good thing, because it's going to reduce the corrosion. And it will do that, but it has negative effects on the uh, fatigue strength, so it's not recommended that you do chrome plating or other plating in fatigue. Sulfur also in brittle steel. The Titanic went down as fast as it did, is now known, because the steel that was made of was high in sulfur. And they, di they didn't understand steel metallurgy back in 19-whatever, when the Titanic was built. So they didn't understand enough about the materials, and they had high sulfur steel. When it hit that iceberg, I think it was brittle. It was cold. It's in 32 degree water. It's brittle steel, hits the iceberg, and it cleaves. The thing just busted in two and went down very quickly. So I'm rushing through this because I'm short of time. But again, you need to look very carefully through chapter six. It's a long chapter. It's the longest chapter in the book. I know that. But I would like you to study it because everything else depends on it from here forward. We're going to talk a little bit more. We're going to do two more lectures on this. I'm not done with this topic yet. So all this week, we'll talk about Chapter 6. And I'm going to do a little bit on Chapter 7, which is surface fatigue. And that will get us through the theory that we need to, to really start designing stuff. And then we'll talk about designing shafts and things like that.